Yeah, my name is Antti. I come from Helsinki, Finland, and I'm going to talk to you about unlearning beliefs uh, to get the new way of working. And it's really true that our beliefs hold us, hold us back. Just like if you were here for Urgis's talk, like 10 years ago, I totally believed I would just like work on a problem and it would go away. I didn't believe in taking breaks, but now I do. <laughs> but it wasn't a kind of easy shift for me. And I was actually, if it was Galileo Galilei talking to the Inquisition about uh, Earth revolving around the sun. So I was, I was like thinking about uh, not needing to take a break. I was like Catholic Inquisition <laughs> in a way. But why these beliefs are so strong and why do they hold us back? It's because our culture comes in three layers. What we see every day is the practices, the processes and rules that are in action in an organization. And behind that is the values that we state as individuals and in organizations. And the values dictate our practices and rules. But behind th those are uh, the assumptions and the beliefs about life and work that we might have and not know about them. And it's really hard to change something you don't know about yourself, you're not aware of. So that's what is ma makes it hard. So what I'm here for right now is to give you ideas and concrete framework of practice on how to help people unlearn their kind of beliefs that hold them back from embracing new practices and new ways of thinking. And I kind of started thinking about this 10 years ago um, when I designed games for learning for little kids to uh, learn science in the Agora Game Lab in the University of Yvaskula. We worked with science teachers um, and they had identified this problem that kids had. They had kind of misconceptions or wrong beliefs or beliefs that didn't fit into the uh, paradigm of science that hindered their learning. So let's take one example. And this is a quick one for, for you, this is a test. So, are you ready? Okay. Why are there seasons? Why, why is it cold in the winter and warm in the summer? Please take a pair and discuss your kind of your theory about it with the, with the person next to you, just for 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, that was 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's check who, who has got it right. Who's thinking or whose model is like this? A couple of people? Like the, yeah. The orbit is elliptical and it's closer, closer to the sun in the summer than in the evening. Uh, in the winter, yeah. Okay, who, who has a, another idea? Okay. The, the orbit is indeed elliptical but much smaller difference. Yeah. Uh, so that's not really a factor. The factor is that when orbiting the, the, the axis of the Earth rotation is not perpendicular to the plane. Yeah, axial tilt, yeah. yeah. Uh, th this is the model misconception many kids have. But then, boy, many graduate students in Harvard <laughs> have that also. So it's, it's, it's not a shame. Uh, but this is act actually the actual fact. The axial tilt causes the rays from the sun enter the Earth's atmosphere uh, in a different angle 
different times of the year. So when they come in straight, more energy gets into the atmosphere and it's hotter. But if you have this kind of model, it's kind of hard to understand uh, why is the ozone layer, for example, causing the uh, has got to do with the climate change. So it's different. We really hard to uh, learn related uh, concept in science if you have a wrong model. So how about this kind of legacy beliefs and knowledge work? And just to have some fun, uh, I, I would like to, you all to kind of do this in a stand-up way. Do you know, have you been in stand-up shows? Yeah? How do you answer questions? Do you know how you, how you answer questions in a stand-up show from the comedian? You're clapping. Okay, cool. So when you see a belief that you have experienced in an organization, uh, please clap your hands. First up, that's thinking. Uh, let me just uh, explain to you. And this is the kind of... Um, misconception, like delivering each batch of work has costs, so it's mo most efficient to do it in all in one big batch. Anyone have that? <laughs> yeah. And it, it does save you some time and money, but the kind of hidden cost is ability to adapt to change, and I think you all know that. And a different uh, kind of related thing is kind of using the specialist time to, for just what the uh, best are is most efficient. And we won't clap. <laughs> yeah. So that was first. Second, one utilization of people is, is good for effectiveness. <laughs> yeah. And you all know the trade-offs. Uh, adapting the chains, handling surprises, predictability, improvement, learning, multitasking, task switching. And the last one, this is because I picked three. I couldn't have picked a hundred, but I, I had to pick three. Is, and this is my favorite because I created the name, Process Rollout Positivism. Uh, what does this mean? Is that you can just... <laughs> Yeah, do a di diagram and then people will work accordingly. And a kind of tweak to this is organization charts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically this is about dividing the organizations into thinkers, people drawing the diagrams and then doers. So you know how it's not so effective. But how to get rid of these legacy beliefs? Well, the traditional way is to inform people of the positive ev effects of the new paradigm. Like, giving lo logical reasons, like this is well, very well on training. But that doesn't work well, as there are no cognitive connections in the brains of the people who are listening to the new knowledge. And it, there's a cognitive conflict uh, between the new information and the old assumptions. And the old, assu old assumptions are better grounded, so they will win most of the time. Um, and this is the problem we had with the kids in the science class too. And when we tackled with it, with games, was it kind of had three steps. First was experience. Giving them a game to play with, it was distanced from the reality, from the theme of the kind of class. It was engaging and fun, but it had the kind of same idea in a distance. And in the game, you, you had to think tactically. And of course, the tactics that worked were according to the new paradigm we were teaching. So they, they kind of found out, OK, when, we, when I do this and this, I'm successful. So they got, they got an experience. But that wasn't enough. The kind of most important thing was reflect, uh, reflection together. Let the kids talk with each other, facilitated by the teacher, about their experience, and say that, OK, the other kids too, my friends also, they tried with the similar tactics. And then we could 
people start to introduce the theory to like this works because of this, this and that, and then they already, already had the experience to connect the theory with. So, well, kind of doing this backwards helps them to grasp the new ideas and the new paradigms. And the third part was application in another, another context to strengthen the connections in their brains. Well, I have another exercise which was not a game to kind of let them use their newfound knowledge. And actually, recently, in the last five years, I found that you can use the same pattern for knowledge work. For example, who, were in, who was in Marcel's Mass More Chance thing? That's, I've used in, it in another way, so that I just let people play the game first, and then we get to the reflection, and after that we get to the theory. Uh, and so it uses the same model. This is a design challenge, 18 minutes, and you have to build the highest tower where Marshmallow can sit at the top. And usually it looks like this. there's lots of planning in the, at the first, and there are some su surprises and, and kind of feelings of uncertainty, okay? This should, be, should have been really clear because we are using spaghetti and tape and everything, but it isn't. And in the reflection, people say, okay, there was more risks than anticipated. And okay, this is actually the parallels to our work context. There's always more risks than we anticipate. And the question is how to deal with uncertainty. And then we can take it to the kind of application level, like, well, if you would Think about uncertainty and risk in, in your work. How could you tackle it better if you, if you are doing workshop with teams? So this kind of simple approach. OK, five minutes. So we might skip a few. <laughs> Actually, I don't have that much stuff, so we might get it. And the second game is the multitasking name game by Henrik Kniebari. Who knows that game? couple of people. Um, basically, there's one developer who has the special ability to write, and he has five customers who come to the developer because they cannot write. And they want their names written down. And there are two phases in the game. In the first phase, uh, we use batches so that the developer has to start serving each customer at the same time. And, and in the second, second phase, he has the VIP limit of one, so he can just serve one customer at a time. And then we draw lead di time diagrams and see how, how much time is taken. And they have to do estimates at first. And it's usually, well, we you know, in the batch version, it's all, all the time, the longer time. And they really can see it. And the experience in this game is kind of funny because they say that, okay, this game really doesn't make sense. Like, nobody would work like that. <laughs> and, in, and when they kind of, in the reflection phase, look at the graphs, then they have to admit that, okay, our everyday work looks like the thing that I just said, that nobody, nobody would work like that. And then they start to say that, okay, we cannot really avoid multi multitasking at our everyday work. But then they start thinking about, oh, is that true? Really? And then we can start talking about their work context and what could they try to do or experiment to make it different. So that's the multitasking name again. That way I have I will have a link to the slides on the slides share with links to all these games. So, and the last is the bear flow game by Carlos Scotland, which is a variation of the broadband game, where you make your own process. You have to process 20 balls, and they have to be in the position of every team member, and you do five iterations and improve your process all the time. And 
when people play this, well, because you can, you have the improvement jobs, like small retrospective after each process. They have the kind of experience that, okay, practice really made us better. And we tried something new and failed. And maybe we tried it a second time and succeeded. And that kind of, if you st uh, still would still try in the same way, we wouldn't make any improvement. So that in the ref reflection, we can start discussing topics like, well, improvements are actually experiments. If you try something new, it can fail. And there might be multiple reasons for that. So we, we might want to experiment more and have shorter experiments to improve. And to improve, you, you need to change something that you are doing. It's not really just working harder. And then we can start talking, talking about how to experiment to improve. And of course, the visibility of processes or, or ways of working is important. But that was the last one. Just to conclude, uh, our assumptions and beliefs hold us back. And here's kind of what I'm offering for you to help us get rid of those old beliefs that hold us back. First, the experience, then reflecting together, and then starting to apply it, this new information, this new paradigm, this new kind of thing that we learn in a real context. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.